the family that mazes together wagers together or something. It's Say Guide in episode 58. In my opinion, that the greenhouse effect has been detected and it is changing our climate. Family is the prevailing theme of this latest episode of Say Guide in focused on the master system. Well, maybe prevailing is not the right term, but at least it does figure in pretty significantly. But then that's only to be expected when you're dealing with the intergalactic family drama that is Fantasy Zone. Depending on which region you play in, Fantasy Zone The Maze presents either a follow-up or a prequel to Sega's whimsical toroid shooter. Here in the West, Sega framed it as the third game in the series, whereas Japanese Mark III enthusiasts, all six of them, were told that Fantasy Zone The Maze preceded the shooters and depicted Opa Opa's training. But not just Opa Opa, Fantasy Zone The Maze brings cooperative action into the Fantasy Zone franchise for the first time, allowing a second player to take the role of Opa Opa's brother, Upa Upa. The two characters play and control identically, so it's more or less an evenly matched experience in which you simultaneously help and hinder one another. So Sega kind of captured that friendly antagonism thing that Nintendo introduced into its own sandbox with their sibling-based turtle-punching simulation Mario Brothers. It honestly makes sense that you see this dynamic attached to games about siblings, because that's pretty much the experience of having a brother or sister in a nutshell. This is not to say that Fantasy Zone The Maze in any way resembles Mario Brothers. It has much more in common with Pac-Man, though if we're being accurate here, Sega has a perfectly fair claim to that style of gameplay that precedes Pac-Man. You can most accurately describe Fantasy Zone The Maze as Pacar, dressed in Fantasy Zone trappings. Remember Pacar? Released for SG-1000, Pacar built on the principles of Sega's early arcade hit Head On. Head On predated Pac-Man and it arguably introduced the idea of collecting dots in a maze to the medium in the first place. Although limited in design, essentially playing out as a game of dot collecting chicken inside a series of concentric squares, Head On was pretty groundbreaking. And rather than convert it directly for home play, Sega reinvented it as Pac-R. Same general idea, use a car to gobble dots, but with much more dynamic gameplay. Packar opened up its mazes, creating spaces filled with open areas and crisscrossing corridors alike. And it introduced a power-up element that allowed players to fend off the opposing cars that pursued them through the maze. This, fundamentally, is the basis of Fantasy Zone The Maze. Still, this Fantasy Zone spin-off leans hard into the elements of its parent series. It's not just a generic maze chase game with Pac-Man replaced by a sprite of Opa Opa. Fantasy Zone's mechanics suffuse this creation. Which isn't to say it lacks Fantasy Zone aesthetic hooks. For those who partake of such things, it has some sweet FM synth renditions of tunes from the original Fantasy Zone. Something not included in that older game's cartridge since it predated the advent of the Mark III FM sound unit. Also, you travel through seven different worlds over the course of this adventure, each of which is kitted out with visual references to the original game. Each world has three levels plus a bonus stage for a total of 21 core levels and seven bonuses. The core levels are pretty challenging. The game allows you to start from level one of any world from the title screen, but realistically, you won't see the final level of the more advanced worlds unless you start from an earlier point in the game and build up your reserves. That's because, once again, Fantasy Zone The Maze takes its remit as a spin-off seriously. Although it plays like Pacar on a fundamental level as you steer your way around corridors packed with enemies and attempt to collect all the dots in that level so you can jump to the next, there are a lot of additional elements here that draw upon the workings of its parent franchise. For starters, the enemies you have to deal with in each maze are the creatures you'd have battled in the corresponding worlds in Fantasy Zone proper. At the beginning of each level, a hatch located somewhere in the current maze releases three monsters. These aren't just random creatures though, they're the base type hovering creatures that you need to destroy in a standard round of Fantasy Zone. Unlike in the core games, these bases don't hover motionless in one place, though you do need to whittle down their health with a succession of attacks before they can die and drop a big coin. Here the base monsters drift through the maze, moving erratically and threatening to destroy you on contact. Although the bases don't actively pursue you, their movements can be difficult to predict, so it's not a great idea to drift too close to them. The bases do release subordinate monsters, too. They don't send them streaming out right away, though. Instead, once all three bases enter the maze, the hatch that released them becomes a power meter. The meter goes from clear to red in a few seconds, 
and once it maxes to full red, the bases pause and charge up their power for a moment. Once they've fully charged up, each base will release another enemy into the maze. These smaller enemies do pursue Opa Opa and Upa Upa directly, and to make matters worse, they're faster than the playable characters. When the bases unleash their minions, the action takes a sharp turn into difficult. However, this is not Pac-Man, so you do have a few different options for protecting yourself. For starters, you can prevent the enemies from ever releasing subordinates. If you pass over the hatch meter while it's charging, or even after it's maxed out and the bases start powering up, you'll reset it back to zero and prevent the bases from launching support creatures. This is more easily said than done, since you need to focus primarily on clearing the maze of dots. If you hover around the hatch for too long, you'll be too slow in collecting dots which means you won't earn any end-of-level bonuses for clearing the stage within a certain time threshold. Your reward, naturally, is coins. As in the real Fantasy Zone, coins are the lifeblood of this adventure. You earn coins for completing stages. You earn coins for destroying enemies. You collect coins in bonus levels. And naturally, you earn coins in the normal course of gameplay. Because those aren't dots you're picking up, you see. They're coins. Yes, collecting the dots you need to clear in order to finish a level leaves you flush with cash. The faster you clear a level, the more cash you earn, and not just because of the bonus awards, but because each maze begins with a mix of small and large coins. Over time, the large coins shrink in size and value, so the game really pushes you to play aggressively and earn as much cash as possible. But you see, coins are not points. The game tracks cash and score separately. No, coins in Fantasy Zone the maze have real value, as in the standard games you can spend coins in order to acquire power-ups. You don't need to stop at a shop in order to make a purchase here. Instead, a predetermined set of upgrades appears at fixed points around each level, each costing a certain amount of cash. Simply passing over a power-up incorporates it into your arsenal automatically. Some of these upgrades last until you die or complete the current level, like the stackable big wings that boost your speed and allow you to evade enemies and complete stages more quickly. Others only provide a fixed number of activations, such as the 16-ton weight, or last for a certain period of time once activated, like the double shot. But there's a bit of roguelike spirit at play here. There's no sense in hoarding coins because you'll die and lose them all if you do. Instead, you should spend your cash and use your weapons. They greatly reduce the difficulty level of the game, and the thing is the improvements they confer upon Opa Opa mean that you're pretty likely to end a level with more cash in hand than when you began, despite the cost of the upgrades. Now, this is also where the competitive, cooperative spirit of the game comes into play. When two people play Fantasy Zone the maze together, they can clear coins twice as fast as a solo player and clear enemies out of the stage with weapon upgrades much more efficiently. But remember, there's only a fixed amount of cash in each stage. So you're out there jockeying for pickups, trying to score the most dough in order to enjoy more perks than your partner. There's a lot going on at any given moment in Fantasy Zone the maze. And it can be a little overwhelming at first, but the way the game builds off the real Fantasy Zone games means that a little familiarity with their workings will go a long way toward easing you into this spin-off. It's honestly the best kind of spin-off, one that does its own thing, but at the same time it smartly adapts the workings of the source material into a new format. Just as Fantasy Zone presented players with more nuance and freedom than a standard scrolling shooter, Fantasy Zone The Maze gives you a lot of different ways to tackle its challenges. And every world has its own distinct feel, too. Some stages consist of manageable interconnected passages, like Pac-Man. Others have large arenas where enemies like to cluster and whose lack of barriers makes it more difficult to predict how the bad guys will move around. And others consist of long, disconnected conduits where you can easily be hemmed in by foes. Do you go after the cache? Do you lurk near the enemy spawn meter? Do you try to clear a stage as quickly as possible or rack up bonuses by destroying enemies? Fantasy Zone The Maze is way more interesting than you'd expect in an entry in the dated maze chase genre to be in 1988, but, well, that's just Fantasy Zone. Too bad this would be the last Fantasy Zone for Master System, at least in the US. Between this and Fantasy Zone 2, it felt like the series was just beginning to hit its stride. Also this episode, we have Parlor Games, with a U. In keeping with the prevailing theme of this episode, Parlor Games shipped in Japan under the title Family Games. I assume Sega of America retitled the game because, well, look at it. Does this say family-friendly entertainment to you? Parlor Games is drenched in a sort of 8-bit seediness, packed with gambling, 
and ladies in casino bunny outfits introducing the events for you, and dudes hanging out smoking and sipping martinis while wearing big-shouldered 80s suits that absolutely scream coke fiend. It's about as tawdry as you get on an 8-bit console in the US, which is to say pretty antiseptic, but still. Parlor Games presents itself as the track and field 2 of casual games, with big sprite avatars doing things on screen and some pretty boppin' music. Unlike track and field 2 though, the event roster tops out at 3 rather than more than a dozen. You have billiards, darts, and something called world bingo. Each of these events offers a remarkable array of play options, but still, it's just three games in the end. Of the three, Billiards is the only one I'd call a real success. It allows up to four people to compete by passing the controller, and offers several different variants and rule sets. But most importantly, it has a simple, easy-to-grasp interface and rule set. In fact, it plays an awful lot like Lunar Pool, aka Champion Billiards for SG-1000, which makes sense because Parlor Games was developed by the same company, Compile. If Fantasy Zone The Maze was the spiritual sequel to Packar for SG-1000, Parlor Games also presents a spiritual successor to an SG-1000 card. Who knew that there was this much creative continuity between the two consoles? Billiards lets you set up a shot by selecting an angle and using a meter to determine the force of your cue strike. The physics seem pretty convincing, and balls behave about as you'd expect on a real pool table. Although it's not a quite as massive an improvement over champion billiards as you might hope given the increase in hardware power, it's pretty respectable overall. Certainly it plays a lot better than Darts, which has one of the most baffling user interfaces I've ever encountered. Even after poring over the manual and reading guides for the game, I'm at a loss to explain precisely how the mechanics of Darts work. You need to aim by lining up your player with the board, then you throw by pressing and releasing the action button a couple of times in a certain rhythm. In theory, your button presses determine the strength and angle of your throw, but in practice the outcome seems kinda random. Sort of reminds me of the interface you find in golf video games, except infused with chaos and frustration. To its credit, the darts game offers several different rules sets, but most of these demand a ridiculous degree of precision. For example, hitting specific types of targets on each throw, which is a tall demand for a game that never seems to behave the way I expect it to. And finally, somewhere in between, we have World Bingo. As you might expect, given the subject matter, World Bingo is strictly a game of random chance rather than skill or accuracy. Each round involves a massive card with 25 spaces numbered 1 through 25. You select a portion of the card to use as your own, and when any of your numbers come up during the draw, you get to claim that space. You begin the game with $100 to wager, and the more you gamble on a round, the greater the rewards you can reap. As you invest cash, the multiplier for landing 3, 4, or 5 matches climbs. One weird thing is that simply landing a number from your card area doesn't automatically register as a hit. The one-armed bandit that dispenses numbers also spins an emote following the number, and you only score if your number is accompanied by a smiling emote. A frown counts as a miss. After a few spins, your hits are tallied and you're given a payout based on your wager and the number of matches you scored. It's not really much of a game to play solo, but I guess it could be interesting in multiplayer. I don't know. Anyway, it's interesting to see Sega attempting to move into the casual space Nintendo had trained its sights on with the likes of Anticipation. Sega's approach was to create a casual game, but not exactly a kid's game. Which makes perfect sense, given Sega's background in arcades and gambling, and Nintendo's background in toys. It's almost kind of predictable. As for what Sega Challenge said, well, nothing. These games only ever appeared in buy them all checklists with no editorial coverage whatsoever. As for Compile, we'll see them again soon under happier circumstances. But for now, it's time to return to the Fantasy Zone. And no, not the Opa Opa style of Fantasy Zone.